Hi, I'm David G. I work for Synadia. This is a NAS and SCADA video. SCADA stands for Supervisory uh, Control and Data Acquisition. SCADA is an architecture and a system used to help those that automate their manufacturing processes or process control. So this could be an energy company, it could be a uh, you know, beer manufacturer, it could be a level crossing, uh, or even just a simple road crossing. PLCs are used everywhere, and the more PLCs that are used, we need a system to monitor them uh, and control them. And this is exactly what SCADA allows us to do. SCADA is described in five levels. So we have level zero, which is the sensors and the actuators. So that might be a temperature sensor. An, actual might, an actuator might be a little arm on a solenoid. You know, you apply a magnetic field, arm comes out, pushes something away. Level one is a, let's say, our immediate field of interest where we can apply programmatic means. So this is programmable logic controllers, it's inputs and outputs from those controllers to the sensors and to the actuators. Level two gives us the view, the supervisory view. So can we observe what the system's doing? It might be a human interface that's looking at a mimic of the entire process. Level three might monitor many of these systems. So multiple stacks of level two and below. Level four are kind of off net tasks. This is like scheduling work pieces, you know, how many bottles of beer on the wall, all that kind of stuff. Um, we're really interested in, in one to three for this particular example. So what have we built? We built SCADA in a box. But the heart of the system is an entry level Siemens programmable logic controller called a logo. It has relay outputs and it's got transistor inputs. If you don't know what those things mean, don't worry. It kind of just means that we can have some very simple on and off inputs and the relays can drive some light loads, AC or DC, without damaging the PLC if they go wrong. So we can use small relays to drive bigger relays and that kind of thing, which means a tiny system like this is capable of turning off floodlights at a football stadium or you know, massive lights for an airport, that kind of thing. Then we've got a 24 volt power supply, and then we have a, basically it's a hardware GUI. It's called a Siemens Somatic HMI or a human interface. It's got a touch screen, and we can build mimics of what the PLC is doing. In this case, I built a small program for the HMI, which is a set of traffic lights with green, amber, and red lights. The way the HMI works is it reads memory locations called tags from the PLC, in which case I'm polling the memory locations for the traffic lights from the PLC to the HMI, which means that I get this animated set of traffic lights. On the far right hand side, this is where NATS meets PLC, is a Raspberry Pi 4 with 2 gig, this running system D, there's some custom Go code, I'll go into that in a moment. Everything's connected at the Ethernet level, it's layer to adjacent, so this is a flat switch, now there is uh, an IP address on every single node. They're all on the same subnet. So they're Mac adjacent. They're also layer three adjacent. And there's an internet gateway on the LAN, which means everything here can reach out to the internet. There's a, there's a firewall as well, a stateful firewall, which means nothing from the internet can come back unsolicited and attack our system. Okay, let's look at the functional diagram then. We push the little button and then the Siemens PLC starts a timer. Then there's a three second timeout. The green light stays on for three seconds. Amber comes on for three seconds. Red comes on for three seconds. That's at the point Alice should cross the road. After three seconds, red and amber are illuminated. Bob can spin the wheels and drive off if he wants like a maniac. And then three seconds later, we move to green. Fantastic stuff. Now, the way that the code works on the Raspberry Pi 4, my custom Go code, as soon as it boots, it makes a reading of the inputs and the outputs and it stores them. Half a second later, it makes another set of readings. If there is a difference between the two readings, it transmits that difference over the WAN or the wide area network, which is my internet uplink, over to NGS, which is the uh, Synadia hosted system. It's NATS. Now on the far right hand side, I've got a NATS subscriber running on a different machine. And it just so happens on NGS that I've got a stream um, being fed from the messages and there's a replica set of three with a 31 day retention policy. So let's dive in to the next bit. Now, just a thought, just before I move across, if you've never done anything with PLCs before, 
it's almost a digital version of electronics. So you have all sorts of logic gates and relays and timers and this kind of thing. And this is exactly how I built the traffic light control system. So you press a button, it starts a timer, it sets a latch. That latch then sets the next timer and there is a set of AND gates and NAND gates which then control the outputs of the, um, the PLC for the traffic lights. It's all fairly simple, but it's not traditional code. It's not like I've written Python code or Go code to control the traffic lights. What PLCs have done and the reason they're widely used is it's enabled an army of mechanical and electrical engineers to build relatively complex machinery without writing any kind of code. It's really quite impressive. So let's transition across to our demo scene. And our demo scene is this. We've got the diagram just so you can keep a mental image or a view of what's going on. The far left hand side, we now have the front panel of the device that I've built. So we have the Siemens Somatic HMI, which is the Mimic. And you can see that the green bottom light is indicated if you're from the US or from anywhere else. Um, the UK system largely looks like this. We have a green light at the bottom, an amber in the middle, red at the top. So the Mimic is, is what you see on the UK roads. The LEDs, the green LED, and there's an amber and red above that, are directly connected to the relay outputs of the PLC. So they will move first. The somatic and my Go code scan at half second intervals. So what you'll see is the somatic will be ever so slightly behind the relays and the NAS messages will be ever so slightly behind there as well. I've done that because I don't want to load up the PLC with lots of TCP activity. And then at the bottom, you'll see a push button there. Right, I'm gonna go and sneak off. and I'm gonna press that button. Keep your eyes peeled because on the console screen, you'll see the events coming down top to bottom. Right, here I go. Give me one second. And there they go. The messages are coming down. It's fairly quick. We'll see now the red and amber transition happen. Let me go back to green. Look at that, fantastic. So hopefully you can see here what's happened. The Go code has pulled the PLC. The PLC has gone through its various state transitions, the messages, the difference, the diffs have happened, the messages then get transmitted over NGS, and then the subscriber is pulling the information from NGS. They're the messages that you can see on the screen. Let's take, however, a bit of a different look. Um, I know there's a diagram over the top. What I want you to see though is the speed of this thing. So I'm just gonna change screen now. And I'm just going to spit them out in terms of JSON. And you should have a much clearer view now. So the top payload, the one I've just highlighted, uh, each payload has the same keys, by the way. Um, there's two fields I want you to pay attention to first. So input acquire timestamp is the first timestamp when I collect the input register and the output acquired timestamp is when I collect the output register from the PLC. So these aren't related to NATS. This is when I pulled the PLC. Then we've got a button and then the three output states from the PLC. So the code polls every half second and it just so happens that it caught the button on one of the polls, which is kind of interesting. Green is our steady state when nothing else is happening. The next state changes when I let go of the button and you should actually see that the timing should be you know, fairly tight. It's like a second, not even that buzz, that 0.2 of a second between me pressing the button and letting go of it. Three seconds later, or thereabouts, the first state change happens, we go to amber, three seconds later, we go to red, three seconds later, we go to red and amber. So one payload above, when we're on red, Alice should cross the road, and Bob should stop. When we're on red and amber, if the pathway's clear or the crossing's clear, Bob can go. So Bob spins his wheels and lets rip and, and goes, and then we go back to red. Now assume that actually Bob ran Alice over. Alice crossed, Bob ran her over flat, splat, oops. And then in court, Bob says, nah, traffic lights were on green. Alice was playing silly, she crossed the road. Now we have the data, we have the data somewhere safe, don't we? We have it in the cloud. It's replicated in three different places. And assuming that the real time clock, and it, hell, even GPS clock, that is accurate, we've now got evidence that we can provide um, that is stored reliably then we can go back and basically pull the state of the system at that particular time, which I think is kind of impressive. But this use case is attributable as well to energy systems, utility, train, crossings, manufacturing, everywhere and every system that emits data 
We can attach NATs to it via some form of a simple connector. We can apply minimal load onto the level one components, extract the data, push it elsewhere for offline processing. Um, we can pass it through machine learning algorithms. We can put it onto warboards. Um, and that might have a really, really nice effect. It might drive down your costs because it means it's less SCADA software. It opens up the data to other developers, web developers, uh, and I, I assume much cheaper than SCADA developers as well. So hopefully you find this example interesting. I've had a lot of fun building this and showing you how NAS and SCADA can work together has been super fun. If you're interested in this, go to synady.com, find one of the members of the team, drop us an email, leave us a comment on this video. You can also find us on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. We'll catch you next time.